Yeah, hello everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, the talk, the Greta talk. And uh, this talk will be given by um, Heiko Hecke. And uh, it's on our uh, book on uh, graph transformation for software engineering. And maybe a few words to Heiko. Uh, he started his uh, career in graph transformation a long time ago in Berlin. <laughs> and uh, Actually, his first work was on um, negative application conditions for graph transformation rules. And uh, then uh, later he went to, um, to the University of Paderborn. And there he worked a lot on um, visual contracts. And um, the topics he uh, selected for today are uh, on visual contracts. So yeah, I'm happy to hear. <laughs> Your talk. Okay. Thank you, Gabi. Started under Gabi's supervision, to be, to, to, to be precise, um, in, in Berlin. So I think you gave the lecture on graph transformation that I got hooked on when I when I came there. So I I came there in my must have been 91 or something like that, or 92, I don't I can't remember. Um, but anyway. Um, long time ago. <laughs> long time ago, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 92, I mean, it would be 30 years, can it be? Anyway, um, so, so yes, so thanks. Um, so, so this is, um, <laughs> it's a bit, the, the numbering here may be a bit confusing. So, so this is, um, it's essentially the third, right? It is the third in the series of tutorials that we were giving uh, on, on, on um, based on, on, on the book that Gabi mentioned. Um, but it is based on part two of the book and therefore I uh, sort of called this part two continued rather than part three because I wanted to be somewhat consistent with the, the numbering, uh, with, the, with the, the, the terminology, the numbering in the book. So, so I did the first part, um, as you can see here, can you see if I point here? Yeah. Um, on uh, the basic concepts on graphs and graph transformation uh, uh, in, in January um, and then uh, Gabi presented um, the the second part, gave an overview of, of the second part of the book, and then in more in, in more detail on the uh, chapter five here. And I'm going to cover now chapter six, a uh, little bit of seven, although I don't go into much detail there, and then eight. So we're talking about service specification uh, using, as Gabi said, visual contracts. Um, and um, and also reverse engineering um, of visual contracts from implementations. Okay, um, so that's the program for today. And you can see that we have a, a few chapters left here talking about uh, uh, sort of other aspects, in particular here 10, 10 11, and twelve about um, modeling language definition and 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 uh, model transformations and so on. Um, and there are a couple of things left also here in the in the foundations part uh, where we could have further installments of the series on, um, as it says here, control structures and analysis and 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 yeah, sort of improvement of graph transformation. So we keep the option to um, maybe have further sort of sessions on that. But let's talk about service oriented systems and about the particular um, challenges there. So the idea in a service on the system, I mean, fundamentally, they are just component-based systems uh, where we have a, um, a separation between the provided and the, and the required services. So, so you can think of a component here just in the usual way, a component implementing certain bits of functionality. And in order to do its job, it uses uh, other services provided by other components, okay? And in this interface here, which is the required interface, it specifies what these services are, okay? And equally, on the other side, you have a component, which we call provider, which provides certain services and the services it provides is specified in this provided interface. So you see the difference in notation, one is a sort of open thing and the other one is a, a just a lollipop. Um, and um, so in the interface, uh, you typically list signatures and then so you have a problem of signature matching. So you basically, I mean, the operations may not have the same name, the parameters may be slightly different. So that needs to be adapted here. Um, but then more significantly, at least for us, um, 
these these um, interfaces or the operations there can also have more detailed requirements attached to them saying what these operations actually do. Um, and, and again, this can happen both for the required interfaces or their requirements there for the operations there. And then you can have the same on the provided operations. So you can say, what are the operations that you actually implemented and how do they work? And as we have to match the signatures, we also need to match those specifications. Okay. So the challenge here is to express these uh, in, a, in, a, in a suitable way, of course, and then to find out how to match them. And in general, this leads to two types of consistency here that we have to ensure. One is what I call here external consistency, which is represented by these red arrows. That means um, the consistency between essentially the requirements of the requester and the descriptions of the provider. Okay, because we need to be sure that um, your requirements are met by whatever I, I, I promise you. To, to, to implement. And then there's internal consistency, which means internally to the provider, uh, we have the consistency between um, uh, the, the, the basically the promises that they make, so the specification of the services they provide and their actual implementation. So, so it's not good enough to just make promises, you also need to implement them correctly. Okay, so this is the correct answer. And we're going to look at both of these uh, questions, starting with the first one, with the external um, version. Okay, so this is the story about service specification and matching. And uh, this example is actually taken from a, from a lecture, um, uh, from a module on service oriented architectures that I've been teaching for some time and that I actually presented this, uh, this semester as well. So, so some of the students, if they're here, may recognize that. So the, the paradigm that we're going to use in order to describe these um, operations is basically borrowed from this idea of design by contract by Bertrand Mayer in, in, uh, uh, from Eiffel. And the idea is that an interface can be seen as a contract between a, uh, between a requester and provider. So an interface says, what are my obligations um, and what are the benefits that I get in, in, in return? And interestingly, the obligations and the benefits of the, the site implementing the interface and the site using the interface are kind of dual to each other, but maybe that's what you would expect. So your obligations are my benefits and the other way around, okay? So if I'm the, the client, uh, uh, then, then um, sort, of my, sort of my obligations, maybe if, talking about an operation to pay a bill, let's say. So my obligation is that I have to provide the account data in order to pay the bill. And my benefits is that after that, I can expect the, pay to, the, the, the bill to be paid, okay? So I won't have to pay it again, yeah? And from the shop point of view, it's kind of dual. Um, so the, the, the obligation of the shop is to guarantee that the bill is paid after the, uh, uh, the client has, has, has paid it, okay? So they need to change the state accordingly. Um, and their benefits are that where they can assume that the client provides them with account data. So if you want to look at this in, in kind of uh, matching ways, you can see that uh, basically there is a relationship here between the benefits and the obligations this way, um, but, also, but also this way around, okay? So one party's obligation should match the other party's benefit. So, so that's the, the general idea. Um, and now you can um, sort of, if we assume that, we, that, that that works, that we understand what that means conceptually, the question is now, how do we express that? So how do we write statements like this in, in, in precise formal language so that they are machine readable and, and, and automatic, can be checked automatically? Mm -hmm. um, and then how to match that? So how, how do you implement or, or, or formalize the, the notion of matching? So what does it mean that one matches the other, okay? So um, let's have a look at that. So, so there are lots of different languages in general which can be used to, to express uh, these obligations and benefits. We will be using um, visual contracts, as I mentioned earlier, which are visual and have a, a nice representation in terms of kind of object diagrams uh, uh, in, in, in UML-like notation, okay? Um, 
So that we will see in a moment. Uh, but before that, there is the question. So if you if you look at the this this situation here, you see that we have we basically have to match uh, uh, kind of benefits and obligations from provider and pro uh, provider and requester in a kind of uh, 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 diagonal way here. If you look at this from the point of view of how um, the interaction actually works between provider and requester, we see something like that. So we have the requester here, yeah, that the client of the service, they decide that at some point they want to call an operation of the provider, okay? And then the provider will execute that operation and then return uh, uh, the, what, whatever needs to be returned um, from, from that operation, okay? So, so the, the requester decides to call the operation and the, provi the provider then executes it and returns from that operation. So that means that it's the requester's responsibility to make sure that the system is in the right state when they call the operation. Yeah. So if you let's say if you if you order something on Amazon and 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 you try to um, you you try to uh, um, you try to uh, uh, I don't know submit the order but you haven't entered your credit card details yet, then the system isn't in the correct state to process your order. Yeah, so it's your responsibility or rather the, the responsibility of the client, which is the front end, the user interface essentially of that of that web application to guarantee that when you, you call the order function here or the submit order or, some, or whatever that is called, um, that the system actually has your credit card details already. Otherwise that, that won't be possible, okay? So that's the requester that has to make sure that that is the case. Yeah, and in return, the 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 provider um, then is responsible for guaranteeing that the right effects are ensured. So so that means if you if you look at this kind of interaction, the requester needs to guarantee the precondition, and then the provider has the benefit of assuming that the precondition is satisfied, so it doesn't have to check that again. And equally, the provider guarantees the effect uh, of the post condition, uh, and and um, the requester can then assume, so can benefit from the fact that that effect has been achieved. Okay, so so that's the the basic model. It is slightly more complicated because, as, as I say here in the in the bottom, um, the requester and the provider here may work with different data models. So there isn't just a question of um, transmitting calls for backward and forward and backwards, but also a question of potentially translating the, the, the data. So translating the, um, the objects from one representation to another one, yeah? because the data models may be different. And there are different ways of doing that. One could be that you have to have a point to point translation. So, so you, you have a mapping of from the data model of the requester to the data model of the provider and back, and you just translate things back and forth. Or you sort of assume that they all use a shared data model in the first place, a shared ontology, um, and um, and then obviously that work has been done already, so you don't need to do that every every time you you do a call. Okay, so both of these options exist, and it depends a bit on on how tightly these are integrated, uh, which is which is suitable here. So let's assume for the moment that we have a shared ontology. Uh, so we just take a, a common data model that is used by both. So we don't have to, to worry about the translation at the moment. We look at this in detail um, in a moment. Um, and this is just an example of how this may look like. So we have, uh, it's a shopping um, example. So we have um, sort of clients and products and bills and account data to, to pay bills uh, with which have sort of banks attached to them. Um, we have transfers, potentially, I'm not even sure we need them at the moment. Um, um, and then we have acknowledgement for, for bills being paid and so on. Okay, so that's the, the idea. And now, as I said, we want to express our um, contracts by visual contracts. So we want to express the pre and post conditions or the preconditions and effect of the operations by means of visual contracts. And if you have a look at the effect specification first, this for the pay bill operation looks very simple. So we have a bill, uh, the status of the bill is open. Okay, and at the end of that uh, operation, the status of the bill should be paid. Okay, so hopefully that's easy enough. Um, so that's the, the effect. 
that we want to achieve on the precondition, so on the on the assumptions that have to be satisfied in order to perform the operation. Um, we have uh, so, so let me just mark this up a little bit. Um, so the precondition is given by by this part essentially. So that says that that gives us everything that needs to be in place before the operation is executed, okay? And in particular, it says, well, as, as, we, as we say here, uh, there needs to be an account uh, uh, and the bank, so account data needs to be provided. And obviously the bill has to be open in the first place, otherwise you can't call that operation, okay? So, so in a way you have the, the precondition here in whatever that is in pink. Um, and if I want to highlight that, I can highlight the, the effect here in, in red. Okay, so one specifies the precondition and the other, was, the other one specifies the effect. So that's the client's view, the requester's view. Okay, now the provider says something relatively similar, but not exactly the same. So the provider says, uh, so the, their precondition basically says, uh, again, it's basically everything that we see here on the left, uh, that there is, um, uh, an account and uh, sort of a bank that provides the account. There also needs to be a client and the client needs to be the owner of that account. And the, the client also needs to be the one that has to pay the bill. So the, the client is the, 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 the one mentioned on the bill, okay? So, so what we see in addition to the previous case is that we have the client uh, and the client is connected to the bill and the account, okay? So, so that means uh, in, in, in sort of plain English, um, you have to provide account data of the client who pays the bill. Yeah, so not 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 just any account, but the client, uh, uh, the, the account of the client who's listed on the bill. Okay, and then the effect is the same. Uh, uh, you basically change. It's a bit more complicated to 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 highlight, uh, but not much more. So, uh, so the effect in that case is is this. Okay, so so the, the, the bill changes its status, and then in, in addition, we create this acknowledgement here. Okay, which we haven't asked for in the in, on the requester side, but which isn't um, which we haven't sort of ruled out either. Okay, just a comment annotation: the the thing in the green box here um, represents. Uh, the context condition. So this is context. So this is these are elements that are basically required and need to be there before the rule can be applied, um, but they are not affected by the transformation. Yeah. So they, they don't change. Okay. So therefore they're just listed on the left hand side here. Okay. So that's kind of by example introducing how we specify these things. And now as I said, we want to describe how they are matched. So if you look at uh, the, entire, the example intuitively, the following should be clear. So if, if the client says, I provide any account data and the provider says, please provide account data for your account, clearly the client's precondition is weaker. So does not imply the um, provider's precondition. Yeah? So I, I, I'm not giving enough guarantees here for the provider to be happy with that. Okay. And since we said that the client is responsible to to provide, um, to, to guarantee the, the, the precondition. So that's the client's obligation. Um, this uh, is not a match, okay? Because there's no implication. Um, on the other side, the, the provider um, guarantees the post condition. So I'm using, sorry, I'm using effect and post condition interchangeably. Uh, uh, so the post condition is basically a specification of the effect, okay? so. The post condition here gives certain guarantees and these guarantees include the guarantees that are expected by the client. Okay, so we have a match in that, on the, we have a match on the, on, the, on the effects, but we don't have a match on the, on the precondition. Okay, so this in this concrete example can be illustrated or, or um, sort of justified as follows uh, in order to, uh, to match, in order to, basically make sure that the client's view here um, guarantees, the, the client's precondition guarantees the provider's precondition, we would have to 
have uh, uh, well something something like this. So so essentially a sub uh, graph relationship here between the, the the clients pattern and the providers pattern. Uh, the, Clients precondition and the provider's precondition, which we don't have because clearly this, this graph here isn't included in this graph. Okay, so that is not the case here. Uh, and therefore, we don't have that um, implication. Okay. Um, as I said, this is easy to repair. Uh, so all we need to do is, I mean, the client needs to recognize that it's not just any account they can provide that they have but they have to provide their own account details okay so so we add the client here and the owns relationship and if we make this the requester's service requirement then this is indeed matched um, by the um, provider okay so intuitively what we've done is we've accepted that uh, so i have to provide my account data rather than just any Okay, so this is intuitively what we want to do. Yeah, and um, the question is now, um, how do we do that? So what is actually required to formalize this? Okay, and this is where we go a little bit beyond what, uh, what is actually in the book, uh, because I wanted to give you an idea of how, how these things are formalized. So what is the kind of theory that you may expect if you look at uh, uh, sort of papers on graph transformation um, and and uh, how we use these to 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 describe problems like this. Uh, sorry, I can sort of probably drop this now. Um, so so we want to formalize a number of different things here. The first thing is that um, first of all, I mentioned service specifications. In the simple case, they are all given over the same data model, yeah. Because if you if you agree the kind of data model or ontology in the first place, you don't have a problem of mapping. But that is not always possible because services can be developed independently by by sort of different parties without prior agreement. And in that case, we have to have some kind of mapping between data models. Okay. So in addition to what we saw so far, we need to map between data models, and that means we also need to translate our data. Uh, our states, our graphs, and our rules, and so on, uh, our, our visual contracts um, uh, between these data models. So this is something I would like to, to add as a feature, essentially, and, 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 and discuss. And the second one is basically what we just discussed. So, so um, these visual contracts, uh, as you could, could see in, in, in the way I sort of played around with that, I mean, in particular, uh, this, this kind of sort of highlighting the precondition here and the effect specification here, okay? They describe um, precondition and effect in the same uh, uh, contract, in the same representation, okay? But in order to do the matching, we have to separate them. Yeah? We have to say, okay, so what is the actual effect specification and what is the actual precondition? And then we can compare them. Okay, and I did that intuitively by sort of outlining this, but we, I want to give you an idea of how to do that formally and, and what is in, involved in doing that formally. Okay, um, so, uh, so this will change the, the, the style a little bit because I will become a little bit more formal. Um, and you can notice because I'm sort of trying to sort of switch to, to handwriting here. Um, but if you if you feel slightly overwhelmed by that, you can sort of just wait for a, for a minute, and then I'm go, I, I go back to the other representation, which will be um, essentially by means of examples and um, in, in the usual style. Okay, so so we need to introduce a concept here, uh, which is called typed graph transformation. Okay, so typed because we have typed graphs and instance graphs. So our graphs are. Uh, the instance graphs are basically the states, the, 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 the data states that we have, the object uh, structures that we are transforming. Um, so our accounts and our um, uh, orders and, and, and bills and so on. Um, and the type graphs are uh, what uh, you would normally consider your data model. So we used class diagram notation for that. Yeah? So classes with attributes and associations between them, no, no operations in this case. Um, so this is what we would call a type graph. Yeah? So it's obvious that both of these are graphs. 
Um, they're just graphs that play different roles. Yeah. So, so a type graph basically is the formal representation of the data model. Um, an instance graph over a type graph is where basically you have another graph. So G, let's say, is the graph representing our instances. So the nodes of this are concrete accounts and concrete bills and so on. Um, and it has a mapping to the type graph, which tells every node, let's say, what 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 type of node it is. So so it tells every it tells a node, for example, that it is of type account, or it tells a node that it is of type bill. Okay, so that's this this mapping here. Um, and we need relationships, uh, so-called morphisms between these graphs. So if you have another instance graph here, let's call that G prime. Uh, we consider mappings between these instance graphs. So let's call that F. Um, and we require that these mappings uh, are compatible with the typing. So that means if I map uh, uh, one node uh, in G to another node in G prime, then they have to have the same type. Yeah. So I can map a bill to a bill, but I cannot map a bill to an account. Okay. So that's the that defines uh, our the objects of interest. Yeah. So the type graph, the instance graphs, and the mappings between them. Um, and then I can define rules. So the visual contracts that we saw are formally rules. So a rule is basically something that has the left hand side. And the right hand side, the left hand side represents the precondition, and the right hand side represents the post condition. Um, and it has this K in the middle, which you can think of as the intersection uh, of, of, of L and R. So basically, what is, is common between uh, uh, sort of the, the before and the after. And um, intuitively, uh, I mean, formally, it's a little bit more complicated, but not much. Um, the idea is that what the rule says is that. You delete everything that is in L but not in K. So you delete L minus K effectively, and you create the rule creates R minus K. Okay. So that is basically the rule gives you an instruction, let's say, on how to change your object graph or your, 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 your data state. Okay. And the way this is formally handled is as follows. Uh, let's just get rid of that. So we assume that we have a graph G here, which is our input graph or the current graph that we want to transform. Uh, and we have a match, which means that we know how the, the left-hand side here is, is uh, sort of embedded into the graph. So you can think of this as an assignment of parameters. So the left-hand side here has variables effectively in it for objects. That these objects need to be assigned, these variables need to be assigned to actual objects in the graph. Um, and then we uh, have two steps here. We have the deletion step uh, as sort of described here. So we create a graph in the middle uh, that is um, a part of G is smaller than G, uh, uh, contains K. Um, and that is, uh, let me just write that, maybe I can write that down here. Uh, so D is effectively uh, G minus uh, L minus K. Yeah. So, uh, let me put that in quotation marks because it's not entirely true, uh, but it's mostly true. Um, so, so this is how the, how I get D. I basically look at G and and, and try to find out uh, so which parts of G are matched by parts of L that are not in K. So this is what this describes. Okay, so this is how I get G, uh, D, sorry. And so this is basically the first step, uh, the deletion step. And then I have the creation step, the, the second one, where I say, okay, my graph H, which is the new graph that I derived, uh, contains R and D, so it's an extension of D. Um, and in a, in, a, in a similar way, I can say, let me see where I am. Uh, I can say H equals uh, D. So I take D and then I add everything I want to add, which is which is this. Okay. So that's the idea. I 
So let me take the quotation, but so just to ex explain why I said this is almost true, but not entirely. Uh, so it's true up to the fact that these are not um, these 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 the elements that I'm talking he about here. So the elements of the rule uh, that I'm talking about here and the elements of the graph here that I'm manipulating, they don't live in the same namespace. Okay. So, so one is the rule contains effectively object variables and the, the graph here contains uh, um, actual object IDs. Yeah. So I cannot just say that I take away the, the, the variables from the IDs because they are different sets. Yeah. So that's a technicality, which basically means I need to inject uh, a translation that I'm mapping to, to make that formally correct. Yeah. But, but conceptually it is, it is true. Okay, so that's the that's how I describe formally what the what the transformation is. Yeah, so so that gives me an operational semantics, which means that uh, if you give me a graph, I have a set of rules. I can tell you in a sense how this graph is changed by these by these rules, and that describes, for example, how the data change of my service changes over time. Okay, so that's the the first part we need to understand. Um, the second part is then, as I said, the mapping between data models. So conceptually, again, uh, so this is not entirely formal yet, so maybe just introducing the idea. Um, you can think of data models A and B, okay? So the A and B, um, and let's say they contain class diagrams, okay? And somehow A, as you can see here, is contained in B. So there's a mapping from A to B, and somehow inside B, I can still see the, the, the result of that mapping. It may be transformed and, and, and renamed and things like that, but, but fundamentally the information uh, that I have in A is still available in, in B. Okay, so if I have that kind of mapping at the model level, so at the type level, then at the instance level, I can have, I can based on that define translations in different directions. Uh, and I call that a covariant, a covariant translation and a contravariant location. This is just a fancy way of saying that I can translate either this way in the direction of the mapping, or I can translate in the other direction against the direction of the mapping. Okay. Um, and so one is uh, the mapping that goes from um, instances of A into instances of B is a translation. Um, the idea is that I basically just change the representation of, of whatever I have here in, in, in instances of A. Um, but I don't lose any information. I rename things and, and, and maybe reorganize things, but I don't re actually lose anything. And the other direction is a projection because the data model B here contains part, parts that are not actually present in A. So, so I have to potentially lose information in order to get from B to A. Okay, um, so that's the, the, the contravariant case. Okay, so, so against the direction of this, this arrow here. and um, well, it's hopefully obvious, at least conceptually, that 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 you have a kind of sort of these these equations here. So if you take if you first do a translation, so you start from A, translate something to B, and then go back. Um, there isn't anything in that that you can lose because because A did, didn't have anything uh, 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 in it. Basically, the instance didn't have anything in it that was uh, uh, that required basically the additional parts of B. So, so if I first apply the translation and then the projection, I get I can I can get back to my original uh, sort of information. But if I take a projection uh, first, so if I start with something in B here, then I apply the projection and then I apply the translation, then I get something that is potentially less than what I started from, yeah, because I have lost information in the projection. Um, so just to illustrate that on an example. Um, this is again an example from the lecture uh, that some may recognize. Um, so, so if you think of the, the data model that I showed you, um, as part of the ontology that that uh, that that I uh, provided earlier, and here is a slightly different data model, a slightly smaller one. So think of this, think of the second one as a kind of comprehensive model which covers both the shopping and the banking aspect. So let's call that a shopping agent or something that basically supports the whole uh, activity, whereas the left-hand side here only represents the shop, yeah, but not all the 
uh, not, not as much detail on the on the banking side. So in particular, it doesn't have the transfers here on the left, and it has a kind of more abstract idea of how a bank account works. Okay, so not all of the details necessarily. Um, so, so then you can see a mapping here. Uh, most of those are just mapped identically, but for example, the bank account here is split up into account data and 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 bank. Okay, whereas here. Basically, you have both the, the account number and the bank code in the same object. Here, you have two different objects. Okay, so it's a very simple example of how a data model can change and how one can be mapped to another one. Okay, so let's assume that this is my. Uh, I can't remember now. Let's say let's say, let's assume that this is the provider and this is the requester. Yeah, or the other way around. Let's say this is the this is the requester and this is the provider data model. Okay. Um, so now if you look at an instance of this, um, so this is an instance of the agent, so of the bigger data model, okay? As you can see, it sort of splits the account information between account data and bank, and it has the transfer here. Yeah? If we apply the projection, so that means we, uh, so what we've seen now is, is an instance of this model on the right-hand side, but now we want to go to a model on the left-hand side, so we apply the projection, um, and that means that we lose the transfer, okay, because there is no transfer, oops, there is no transfer class here, so we can't represent that, so we lose that, um, and we merge the bank account, um, we merge the bank accounts together essentially because they are not uh, separated anymore, okay? So that's what happens um, in the kind of uh, sort of contravariant direction, and in the covariant direction, so in the direction so if you, if, you, if you take that and now map it back to the to the agent representation, uh, maybe not so surprisingly, um, we don't get back our um, our transfer object, yeah? because basically all we have is this, and we translate it back to the to the bigger data model. We don't regenerate anything. Yeah, we just we just change the representation. So so what we end up with is less than the original model, but basically like the original model, except for the bank, uh, sorry, for the transfer here, okay? So that's the, um, that's the idea, okay? So this is conceptually what happens if you, if you migrate basically between the different data models. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so, so let's look at what, what that means formally. And again, I'm, I'm going to draw a couple of diagrams. Uh, let's see how, how helpful is that. So, so I said that um, a typed, it's an, an instance graph, let's say G, is given over a particular data model. Okay, so this is a case of of of, of G being typed over a, a, a data model called TG, and we have a morphism here, a mapping between the data models. So from TG to TG prime. Um, I call it that. And now it's quite easy to translate um, uh, sort of this to into an instance of TG prime because all we need to do is basically uh, find a way to, to tell uh, the elements in G what their types are in, G, in TG prime, but we already know what their types are in TG and we have a mapping from T to TG prime. So we can just take an element in G, map it to, to TG, and then map it further to TG prime, and then we know what the typing of each element in, in um, let's call that G prime, um, of each element in, 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 in TG prime. So that's easy. That's basically just a renaming of types, okay? Um, and uh, obviously TG prime can have more types than TG, yeah, because TG is embedded into TG prime, so TG prime can be bigger, uh, but that doesn't concern us because G will not use any, any of the additional types in TG prime, it will just use the types that, that are translations of the types of TG, okay? So that's the covariant translation. The contravariant translation uh, basically goes the other way around, so we assume that we have something here we have something here over uh, the target model, over the target um, type graph, okay? And we map this, we want to map this to something over the source type graph. And this is something that is called, uh, and technically in, 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 in the language that we use here, is called a fullback, 
uh, and you can imagine this or you can think of this as a as a kind of inverse image so so you basically take t here uh, apply this reversely to uh, g prime and then you get this um, and this is your your g yeah so basically what this means is that you you take the smallest thing here um, that you can map to g prime yeah that that basically is a part of g prime no oh, sorry not the smallest the largest is the largest thing here that you can map to g prime and that is also embedded in 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 tg okay so that means you have to drop everything that uh, from from g prime that you cannot represent uh, in in t over tg because you you don't have the classes to represent it yeah so so as i said earlier um it's basically the same in in, in our example so this was the the bigger data state and that was this, the data state that was the same essentially except for the um, um except for the transfer object yeah which we dropped because the transfer class isn't in tg um isn't present in tg okay so that's the idea so you can formally describe how these these mappings work um, and in the same way you can also map these rules that i showed you earlier so you can translate the visual contracts and you can also translate the transformations okay so that basically mitigates if you like between the the, the, the mitigates the fact that our different models uh, for the different services are given over different data models okay so that takes care of um of this part here so let's just sort of take this off okay and now let's have a look at the visual contracts um and the fact that as i said they are a little bit sort of unwieldy uh, for the purpose that we actually have here because they um they uh, they cannot be compared directly but we have to kind of separate the preconditions and effects first yeah, before we can compare them and um let's start with the preconditions so what does it mean to compare preconditions um so this is not too difficult because the preconditions are just graphs uh, and i made it a little bit more complicated because i like as Gabi said, uh, I like uh, negative application conditions. So I added sort of kind of forbidden contexts here as well, information about forbidden context, but it's, 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 it's really relatively basic. So, so I have um, the, 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 the left-hand side of, let's say, a contract uh, or rule P. Okay, so let's say that is my provider rule. Um, no, sorry, it's not my provider rule, it's my requester rule, okay? So this is my requester rule. Um, and I said that the requester rule should imply the, the, pre the, pre the precondition of the requester should imply the precondition of the provider, okay? So the precondition of, my, of the requester is this one, okay? And the L here is just the left-hand side of the rule, okay? So that's my, my basic data that I need in order to apply the, the operation. But then I added here uh, something that is called the negative application condition that basically shows uh, additional context, additional elements that are forbidden that must not be there, okay? So for example, if I create uh, an order for a, for a particular, maybe, no, sorry, order maybe is not a good example, but if I create a bill, for example, for a, uh, 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 for a particular order, Okay, I only want to do that if I haven't created that bill already. So I don't want to create another copy of the bill. I only want to create one bill. Yeah. So for that purpose, I could use this this kind of um, um, construction here. Okay. So 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 what do we do? Uh, uh, we have to first of all ensure that whenever I have a match, so whenever uh, this precondition is satisfied, then also this is satisfied, and this means that whenever I have a match for LP. Uh, I also have a match for a Q, and the way to guarantee that is to require that. Um, well, I actually have an embedding here. Um, so if I have a relation like this, if I know that um, LQ is embedded in LP, then whenever I have a match for, L, for, for LP in G, so G is my current state, then I can extend that to a match of LQ. Okay, so that takes care of the first requirement okay so every match here can be extended here 
And now I have to check whether that also works with the additional negative conditions with the kind of forbidden context conditions. And in order to make to guarantee that, um, I also have to ensure that the negative context conditions here of LQ um, are actually um, sorry, the, 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 the negative context conditions of LP are Are embedded in those of LQ. Okay. And the reason for that is that my, um, my requirement here is that, as I said, there needs to be a match for the for the for the elements here in, in, in G, but there must not be a match for the negative elements. Yeah, so let me just put it like that. So that is forbidden. I don't want that. So I want. I want this embedding here, but I don't want this embedding. Okay. And now uh, assume that you have this embedding here of M, uh, of, of LP and M. Okay. So as I said, we can translate that into an embedding of LQ. Um, now, if there, now, now we can see that, that um, um, if there's no embedding like, like this of LP uh, minus, then also there is no embedding of um, LQ or the other way around. If you turn that around, it basically says, if there is an embedding here, then I can extend that embedding to an embedding here. Yeah, so, so, so this guarantees that um, the preconditions, both the positive and the negative parts are uh, uh, implied in the right way. Okay, so, so that takes care of that. Um, and then the, the second part is, that we want to show that the the um, the effects are um, I should have said effects here is probably uh, is probably um, clearer but so the effects of Q extend the effects of P yeah so so Q as I said is my provider and the effects that the provider achieves or guarantees in the in the in the specification should be um, at least as much. Uh, uh, as the effects that are expected by the um, requester. And I, 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 I didn't say effects, I said min here. And the reason for that is that I'm, the, the, the effects are formally represented by so-called minimal rules, okay? So I can take a rule and create a minimal rule uh, from that rule that is basically minimizes the context. So has 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 no additional context. Um, it's basically a pure pure effect specification, and then I comp then I can compare these. Yeah. So if I take this minimal rule p for, for p and the minimal rule for q, um, I can require that one is embedded in the other. Yeah. And again, you see something here that is called a pullback, um, and it's probably too complicated to explain now why that ensures exactly what it does. But it basically says that uh, the, the the rule at the bottom here deletes and adds as much as, 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 as the rule at the top, okay? Right, so that means we need minimal rules. And, and <clears throat> that was the last thing I wanted to do in a kind of more formal way, uh, just to give you a feeling. Um, I don't know how useful that is for those who haven't seen uh, this kind of construction before, but the question is, how do we get the minimal rule, okay? So, uh, so I said a rule looks like this. Yeah. So we have the left hand side, the right hand side, the interface, and sort of these two embeddings here, which tell us what is deleted and created. Um, and now we can construct here a minimal rule that uh, uh, basically works like this. So we can say that. Uh, so first of all, form construct something that is called. Uh, That is called uh, is technically called uh, an initial push out. So an initial push out it basically it basically says that uh, as I said this this part here sorry this part here describes what is deleted, and that part here describes exactly the same deletion but does so with with minimal context. So it has the, the sort of the most econ economic way of saying uh, saying the same thing. Okay, without additional elements, only the elements that are really needed to describe that effect. Uh, and equally on the right-hand side, we have uh, 
I don't know what was uh, wrong. That should be k l zero, and on the right hand side we have k r zero and r zero. Uh, so we do the same thing. So, so that means we minimize both sides of the rule. Okay. Then we take uh, what you could effectively think of as the intersection, uh, as the intersection here of, um, of these two guys, okay? So the intersection is obviously embedded into each of the things that it is made from, okay? So then you've got this, uh, you take the gluing, so the union essentially of, of these two guys, okay? So this is formally called the push out. Um, and this is, we call that KM here, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Yeah? So basically um, we do a, another, what is called a pullback and another push out. Um, and then we can find that there is an embedding of KM into K, yeah? as I just shown here. So this follows from a general property of of, of these constructions. Um, then we can do another couple of push outs, uh, one over here and one over here. Uh, go this way. Then again, because these are push outs, I find embeddings down here. And I think then I'm done um, because now, if you look at this very carefully, you will see that I got another rule here. Uh, so let's say that one, that one, that one. So the part that I highlighted in red now uh, forms another rule because I have the K and I have the left hand side and the right hand side. And this is now indeed embedded into K uh, uh, by a, a pair of sort of diagrams, as you can see here. Um, and one can show now, thanks to this construction, that this is in fact the smallest possible rule that has the same effect as the, the original rule I started from. Okay, so this is my minimal rule. And with this minimal rule, I can now do the comparison that I that I that I talked about here. Okay, so, so if you haven't seen this before, this will go well over your head, I'm sure. Uh, I, I just want to get to give you a flavor of how this is um, how how these things are formalized and how these things are, are are sort of verified in the in the theory. So if you ever come across one of the actual sort of theoretical graph transformation paper, you'll find a lot of this kind of business. Um, in there and, and, and more. I mean, this is a sort of moderately complicated case, but uh, certainly not the most complicated example. Okay, so so this is to, to basically wrap up if you like the kind of formalization here. Um, and so now let's talk quickly about this part here. And let me just skip a little bit over the first part, which was on testing because I think the second part is more interesting and we're running a bit out of time. Um, so, so the idea here is that we, we can guarantee the consistency here, okay, between the provider, what the provider implemented and, and, and their specification of what they implemented by essentially reverse engineering the description from the implementation, okay? So rather than writing something here and then implementing it and then having to demonstrate afterwards, we get the, the um, specification directly from the implementation. So that's what we want to do. Um, so we, we have a Java application in this particular case, um, and we want to have these visual contracts generated from the Java application yeah, rather than having to create them ourselves. And we're looking at a different example here. It's a car rental service. So the idea is that we have branches of a car rental service, which has, um, um, number of attributes like branches in different cities, essentially we have cars 
the actual vehicles with registration numbers, you have clients that are registered with several branches, and obviously clients can make reservations and reservations tell us basically for a particular car, uh, which can be picked up and dropped off at various branches and clients uh, sort of reservations are made by clients, of course. Okay, so that is the, that's kind of the basic operation of the car rental service. And now if we have an implementation of that in Java, okay, the idea is that we can extract these visual contracts that I described. So look at an example here. So this is, let me have a look. Um, this is not, no, this is, this, this is not one of this example. Um, so, um, so what we do is uh, we have sort of this, this um, process here in several steps. So, so first of all, we need to, um, to instrument the Java code. So basically we need to add, to, we add annotations in the Java code that tell us um, when the code runs, what are the objects in the code that have been um, affected by the operation, okay? So we execute an operation that executes a number of basic statements um, and these basic statements then will, um, will uh, uh, read and write attributes and, 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 and objects, create objects, delete objects, etc. Yeah. So, so that's what we do with the kind of instrumentation. And then we need to define a number of test cases because we need to execute our program in order to observe these changes. Yeah. So then when we execute this, we lock these changes. So we remember everything that has changed essentially uh, in our object graph when we execute our, our operation. Um, and derive something that is called a contract instance. So that's, um, uh, uh, where is that? Um, I think I'm missing my contract instance. Uh, let me see. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have a look at this example. So, so, so let's 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 say we have two different cases where we executed uh, an operation here of. Um, cancel reservation, okay? So a client wants to cancel uh, all their reservations. Yeah, so we give it an input as a client and then we want to cancel all their reservations. Um, and in the first case, when we execute this, uh, it looks like this. So we have one reservation here. Uh, so we basically have to go through the list of all the reservations of this client. Um, but um, uh, so the first reservation isn't relevant because it's not connected to this particular client. So this is there in the in the observation, but it's not actually affected. The second reservation um, is, 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 is made by the client and we disconnect that from the class. We don't actually delete the reservation, but we disconnect it from the client. Okay, so this is the, the first case. The second case here is that we execute the operation again with a different client. Um, and in that case, um, it only affects uh, one reservation. So let's say maybe that is the first one in the list that we find. So we only look at this particular reservation and, and, and cancel that, so make delete the link here. Okay, so, so these are sort of condensed representations of the observations. Um, from this, we can then essentially create some kind of abstract intersection so we say, so what is shared here between these two? Yeah, so, so certainly we have uh, sort of disconnected here a reservation from a client. So that's what we see here. So there's a reservation here uh, and there's a client here and then they're disconnected. Um, and we also abstract from the, the attribute here because the attribute here isn't actually Sort of needed, or it's not, it's not, it's not common. So in one case, the attribute value is one, is C one, and in the other case, it's C two. So, so apparently, the effect here doesn't depend on that particular value. Okay, so that's uh, what happens in the first step, um, and that is actually again uh, based on the construction of a minimal rule, uh, which is essentially the same construction that I showed you before. Um, except that uh, it, it's used in a different way here. So we start from um, essentially a representation like this. Okay, so that's the rule that we observed. And then we want to derive a minimal rule from that, yeah, which basically 
just contains the effect that is actually achieved here, but no additional information, which is in this particular case, uh, well, something like this here. And that is, again, a construction of the smallest rule able to perform a certain transformation. Yeah, so it's exactly the same construction as the one that we saw before. And from that, we construct then a maximal rule. The maximal rule is basically the intersection of all the, um, of all the instances here. Okay. In this particular case, the maximal rule is the same as the minimal rule. So, so I hope that's not too confusing, but um, that's the case. Okay. So that's the first step, or maybe rather the second. Um, and then, and then we have a number of different uh, sort of ways in which we want to generalize this, because, for example, in the case of of the cancelling of of reservations, or for example of showing reservations, it may be that we have. Um, very similar rules that just differ in the number of objects that they touch. Yeah, so we may just we have we may have one case where we need to uh, uh, where we need one reservation. Uh, we have another case where we have two reservations. We may have uh, sort of cases with three or four or five reservations, and we don't have, want to have separate rules for all of them. Uh, we want to summarize this in one sort of high level abstract way. And what we infer here instead is a is a rule that looks like this, which includes uh, what we call multi-objects. So, so, so it basically says, uh, uh, okay, so for a given client, pick up all the reservations that the client is, has made. So this, this kind of stack symbol here represents the set of all reservations that are made by this client. Um, and then for all of these, they are added to this um, collection that is then returned. Okay, so this is, uh, Basically, you can think of this as a variable uh, for a collection or for a set of objects rather than an individual object. Yeah, and we are able to infer that sort of automatically as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we also need to uh, uh, abstract away from concrete values of parameters. So, so if you if you look at this, these examples here, they have. I mean, concrete attribute values here, London and, and, and zero and RICO and, and C1 and so on. What we actually want is something like this. Uh, we want something like um, uh, abstract um, variables here for these parameters and maybe arithmetic expression saying that the number of clients at the moment or the, 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 the in, in, in this case is increased from n to n plus one. So here we say zero to one. In general, uh, the, the number maybe should increase from, from n to n plus one. And again, this can be done um, automatically using suitable sort of machine learning techniques or, or logical inference techniques that, that can infer logical expressions like these from um, sample data, essentially. Okay, so that's the 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 essentially the end of that story. There is a tool, or at least there used to be a tool. I don't think that actually works anymore. Uh, so maybe it needs to be resurrected if any, anyone is interested in that to do all of that. So that extracts these construct instances first by, by um, kind of the monitoring and tracing, then generalizes them, as I said, and then infers kind of advanced features like these multi objects and attribute conditions and parameters and so on. Um, and then visualizes all of that nicely in and this is just an example of how this looks like. This is a contract instance. Uh, this is the kind of generalized view, um, for example. Um, and then we did a bit of work on evaluating that and discussing how well that works. Um, but I'm not going to go into that now because I think time is up and um, uh, I want to leave some time for, for questions and discussion. So thank you very much for now and um, I'll leave it at that, thanks. I don't know, let me show a nice slide in the end. Oh, never mind. Let's just leave that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Raiko, for your talk. And um, yeah, are there questions? <clears throat> <clears throat> I do not see any question on the chat. But maybe you have some, uh, Nicola has a question. Thanks, Raigo. Uh, um, I was just wondering, I mean, that's a theoretical question, 
um, concretely. So, so the data type you are assuming is something like, a, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, is this one of these symbolic or attributed graphs or what's, what's the exact data structure here? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily. Uh, it's, it, it works. I mean, and from a, from an implementation point of view, it works for for regular kind of attributed graphs. So it's not. It's not. Um, but I mean, the point is here that that we don't actually represent the states. The the the, the first. Um, the only time we actually talk about concrete data is in these contract instances, um, and. They are just regular attributed graphs. So, so because yeah. I'm asking that because I'm trying to understand this operation. Um, so I suppose uh, I mean I guess I'm asking what are the monomorphisms. <laughs> I'm trying to understand. So, what exactly is the status of this um, sort of embedding? Uh, basically, categorically, you just have uh, attributed graph. And if it's in a rule, the attributes play the role of variables, I guess. And then if if you match. You essentially, so you need essentially something like an embedding uh, mechanism on the level of these attributes. Yes. So, is that is that formalized uh, somehow? Presumably, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but I don't think. I mean, that's that's really the same as in normal attributed graphs. So you have you have um, the rules have variables. The rules are okay. So so okay. So let me say maybe formally um, me how this works. So. So rules, um, right? So so rules are attributed over um, expressions with variables in them. So we have, uh, let's say, we have a set of variables x. Okay. So then we have the set of terms mm -hmm. over x for, I mean, whatever signature we we have. Okay. And then let's say uh, uh, then say, say the rules. Uh, so let's say are attributed uh, over t of x. Okay, so which means uh, not exactly true, but in principle there is a mapping from basically uh, uh, the graph part, let's just say Lg, to the attribute part uh, to t t, t x. Uh, which is, I mean, if you look at it more carefully, it's more like a partial mapping or a relation, but, but in principle, you can think of this as a mapping between, between these two. And then the same happens for the graph part, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the for the instance graphs, let's say that you're transforming, and let's say here you have a graph G, um, and again, that has a, a graph component and an attribute component, but here technically the attribute component is not a term graphs, but it's some kind of data algebra A, okay, over the same signature. So, so again, effectively a partial mapping or a, a relation, okay. And then you have a match that that basically works on the graph part um, and a homomorphism, an algebra homomorphism that works on the on the uh, on the attribute part, um, right. and which which is obviously defined. I mean, as soon as you define the mapping for x, because uh, because this is a set of terms here. The 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 mapping of the terms is uniquely determined by the mapping of the attributes. Yeah, so if you look at it from a from a sort of representation point of view, um, you only need to look at the if it, if you like the substitution or the assignment of variables uh, of, of of the variables and sorry, making a mess here. Of the variables in x into a, and then it ex extends to the terms, of course. Now, so that's how the morphisms are defined, and um, there is something subtle about uh, the the notion of morphism here. So, um, in the sense that, uh, yeah, exactly. So, if you talk about monomorphisms or epimorphisms or something like that, you need to, I think, restrict that to the graph part. Um, and and so it's not a monomorphism, I think, in general, um, because you could have that different um, expression. So even if it's injective on the attributes, uh, sorry, in, in, if it's injective on the variables, it could be non-injective on terms. Yeah? I mean, just I mean, just think of 
x, I mean, you have, let's say you have x and y here, uh, mapping to one and two, mm -hmm. yeah? and then you have a term x plus y and a term y plus x. Yeah? So it would be injective on the variables, but mm -hmm. not, not, not injective as a, as a homomorphism in general. And, and so um, the usual trick is that these are mm morphisms. They are not... Um, yeah. Uh, basically, you have to the, define a certain class of morphisms here, uh, which is not necessarily the the, the, the injective ones. I just recently uh, looked at, at, at Eric's book again, exactly about this, about the about the sort of the way yeah. in which so other not, class not, are m adhesive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're not necessarily m morph. I think the m morphisms have to be monos, and they are not necessarily monos, but but mm -hmm. they are. Um, sort of especially you have to have a special class of morphism depending on what you want. So for example, for EM, you cannot do a straight EM factorization, for example, mm -hmm. uh, but, but some kind of other factorization. Um, so you have to identify suitable. Uh, so EM factorization is relevant because it, it's basically cutting, is it, it, used in some cases for cutting of context, for example. Yeah. But this, is, um, this has been done. Um, Jens has a comment maybe, maybe mm -hmm. yes. Hi. Um, another question in a similar direction. Uh, when you explained the mapping between data models, if I didn't miss anything, in one case you split up the attributes of a single node and distributed them um, to two different nodes in the second meta model. And I wondered how this would be possible using a graph homomorphism. Yes, yeah, so, also technically, so let me, let me, let me see. Um, if I make... Yeah, the... I think I yeah I think I cheated a bit here. So it's not it's not it's not a straight homomorphism. So, so so what you actually have here in this particular case. So in order to achieve that particular effect here is a span, um, which allows you to split things up and merge them again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so the span is but it's basically um, it's basically a seek, uh, it's basically a combination of um, well, you have the span, and the span basically is, is, is in order to, to, to look at the mapping that the span actually pr produces, um, where you take the, I guess, the contravariant first and then the covariant one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, 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 it's a bit more complex. In, in this particular example, if you want to do something like that, it's, it's, it's actually the mapping is a span, and then they have to, to do both of these things in, in, in each direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's, good, it's a good point. Uh, some people pay attention. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, are there further questions? So, I would like to ask you, Raiko, what is mm -hmm. the uh, current status of? Um, bringing these ideas into practice. So you talked about the theory and, and the other, on the other hand, we have practice and this is an application of graph transformation. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, as a, I mean, purely as a, as a modeling tool, um, I mean, we are using that in, in, just to, to, to document things in, in, I mean, in teaching at the moment. So there's no particular challenge with that. It's basically like writing pre and post conditions in plain language. You can write them diagrammatically. Okay. So that doesn't have a big, um, a big um, requirement in terms of tool development. If you want to use that more formally, you need tool support. And we don't have tool support that actually works well enough to, to, to use that in. Um, sort of in, in sort of industrial applications, where sort of quite recently I came back to some of these things um, is um, in, in discussions with companies who are basically doing very similar things like this, 
um, but not kind of at, 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 at the actual implementation level. So they don't represent them like this, uh, but they're essentially um, working, I mean, something called knowledge graphs, um, which is a, is, a, is, is a kind of convergence between, um, um, I, I guess, graph databases on one hand, so graph representations and graph databases, and um, so kind of semantic web uh, kind of technology on the other hand. Yeah, so both, I mean, think of RDF graphs on the one hand and, and, and graph databases on the other hand, and they use different graph representations and uh, sort of the communities are slightly different, but you have a sort of increasing number of applications that, that mm -hmm. can work with these knowledge graphs and they also need kind of concepts of, of I guess, service-oriented architectures yeah, because they structure their applications and the knowledge graph sits, they basically have graphs sitting in these components uh, of, of these, 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 these big applications. Um, and so they need to, they think of their, their, their data state as a graph in that sense. Um, and the services that they provide are essentially services of sort of transforming or querying those, those graphs that they have in those, in those components. So, so that's more the semantic level of what we're talking about here. Uh, I guess maybe the concepts and the operational intuition and semantics rather than the notation. So they don't use the notation, they program these things directly, um, but, but they basically use very similar concepts and, and we're interested in sort of understanding, yeah, kind of from a more abstract point of view, how they work together. Yeah, so that was the kind of, I mean, that happened over the last year. I had a sort of a series of discussions with a company in New York who are building applications based on these 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 knowledge graphs, and um, yeah, we're interested in sort of understanding the, the the kind of scientific background to these things. So you yeah. provide a kind of model based approach to this. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's model based, but it's model based at runtime. So so they use essentially is 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 a combination of if you like semantic web and graph databases on the one hand with these component oriented and service oriented concepts um, and the idea that they basically have these yeah, sort of models at runtime and to some extent do dynamic dynamic matching and binding uh, at runtime. So they use the kind of um, semantic web technology for, for that as well. So it's, 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 it's quite, so it's basically, Basically, putting everything together that I ever heard of in this context, <laughs> um, and in quite a, a, a nice and and well organized way. So so um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it sounds interesting. Yeah. And, and probably more concepts than than we have ever. I mean, as as as, as you have often. I mean, more concepts than than. Then we have fully formalized. Yeah, this is good for us. Maybe yeah, yeah. So, so somehow it's more find it's more new problems <laughs> to solve. <laughs> I'm supposed to to advise them uh, and, and sort of do a bit of consultancy for them. But what happens at the moment is that they try to explain to me what they do, and I try to sort of reflect it back to them, saying, "Okay, so this I understand could be this. This I understand could be that." But I'm not really telling them anything new. I just sort of. <laughs> Maybe I structure it a little bit differently, but 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 I'm basically reflecting what they what they tell me rather than proposing really new concepts. Yeah, because they have enough concepts, they just more need they need, they need structure and 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 sort of understanding of the foundations of that, which is which is a nice sort of thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but first you have to understand what they are doing <laughs> to propose yeah, exactly, some structure. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, are there further questions? I do not see any. So then maybe I propose to close here. Thank you very much, uh, Reiko, for the talk. Thank you. And uh, yeah, there may come more talks on this. <laughs> So, so thanks a lot to Gabi also for the guest hosting, <laughs> the impromptu. <laughs> it's very nice. And thanks a lot to Raiko for, for the tutorial. Um, and I think our next scheduled talk is on April 22nd. It's actually with Jens, I think, with Jens Kosiol. 
Um, we might have another talk in, in the meantime, so just maybe just check out our Twitter or, or my link this. And for everybody who still wants to have a quick chat, we will stay on Zoom for a moment, but I will now switch off the live stream. So if you're still on Zoom and you want to join the chat, just go to the registration page. And so once again, to, uh, many thanks, Raiko. And yes, everyone have a good weekend.